Welcome back everybody to the channel. Welcome to another fantastic week to learn about finance. This week we're continuing with our income-based valuation of companies and assets and returning to look at what's called capitalization of earnings. It's pretty similar to DCF valuation and discounted cash flows in general, uh, but there's a little bit of a spin on it. It's used for different kinds of companies to value them. So it's kind of important to know how this works in conjunction with DCF and the differences between them and when you should use one or the other. So I hope you enjoy this one and I'll see you guys next time. Welcome back everybody. This week we are talking about another income-based valuation method called capitalization of earnings. And this is another pretty popular one, not as common as DCF, but it still is popular. So continuing from last week with income-based valuation models as we've mentioned, to value businesses, we are actually going to take a look at the capitalization of earnings approach. It's worthwhile noting that it's similar, but not exactly identical to DCF valuation. So let's take a look at the, what's called the capitalization rate, first of all. Like DCF valuation, capitalization of earnings, or CE I'm using here for short, utilizes current period earnings figures, so for that current period or year, of a business, as well as expected future performance in order to give it a proper value. DCF models arrive at the net present value, or NPV, as we've talked about last week. And CE, or capitalization of earnings, divides the net present value by the capitalization, or cap rate. So this is a rate used to divide the NPV. So let's take a look at some drawbacks of income-based valuation in general. One of the caveats of income-based valuation is the need for a deep understanding of the business in question, especially in terms of the financials. Now, in order to do this, you need to be adept in fundamental analysis to properly value businesses using these models. This means that it's tricky for people who aren't adept in fundamental analysis and finance in general to do this. In any scenario where a business has a complex financial structure or one where it suffers from accounting errors or fraud, such as Enron, this will seriously affect the ability to utilize income-based valuation and these valuations will likely be incorrect in many cases. Regardless of this, these techniques always suffer from uncertainty and this is just inherent due to the estimation of future cash flows and the growth of the business that's unknown at the current time. This is why we prefer easy and more simplistic models like the ones we've mentioned, and why we try to limit the number of variables we use in the models, or else it becomes more like a black box. Valuation models based on company size. Let's take a look at this now. The cap rate that we've talked about before, or the capitalization rate, can be difficult to determine, very similar to the issue we had with the discount rate in the DCF model. It's very difficult to figure out exactly what it should be. Smaller companies typically utilize a cap rate that's industry standard that reflects the ROI or return on investment that investors seek to earn based on the risk profile of that company. And typically this is between 20 to 25%. The figure for the cap rate, which we will see below in a formula, must take operating expenses such as salaries as well into account to find this cap rate. And this is typically for larger companies. So for example, if the gross profit of a business is $1 million and $400,000 is paid in operating expenses or operating costs, which is mostly salaries, we use the remaining $600,000 for the valuation. Smaller businesses often are better off and utilize a DCF model for valuation, and this is due to their high growth figures for a set period of time into the future, and this is before they become stable at lower growth rates, in which case CE valuation is more useful. Larger companies actually benefit from utilizing the CE valuation method 
And the reason for this is it is easy to compute and also easy to explain to in the case of a lawsuit or an audit. Now let's take a look at how to actually calculate the cap rate for a larger business. For mid to large size companies, we need quite a few metrics in order to properly value the company. Once we know enough, we can find the cap rate as follows. And we need these specific things just for the cap rate. The rest is just cash flows that we need. So it's defined as the operating income of a business divided by the price at which the company can be purchased, the total price, if it were in a merger or acquisition. So in order to find this operating income in the numerator of a business, we first need to determine the gross profit or earnings. And these are used interchangeably. Gross profit and gross earnings are the same thing. The gross profit is simply the revenue of the business minus production costs. And this is simply for the cost of the product and to build it and stuff like that. And when we compare it to operating income, gross profit still incorporates operating costs. Therefore, in order to find the operating profit or income, we need to subtract all the operating costs from this gross profit figure. And this includes things like salaries, electricity, rent, all those other costs as well. And this allows us to arrive at the operating income or operating profit to be used to find the cap rate. We can then divide that by the purchase price of the company. And again, this is if it's bought by an investor or by another company. And we can note that the operating income will always be less than the purchase price so that the cap rate is less than one. And this makes sense in theory. Now, it's important to understand that what exactly that cap rate measures when we're looking at valuing a company. So much like the discount rate in a DCF model, the cap rate encapsulates the risk tolerance of a shareholder or purchaser of the business. Now, the more volatile the swings in cash flows over the years, expected or actual, the more risky and the higher the rate of the cap rate. Unlike the discount rate, however, the cap rate also incorporates various market-based and macroeconomic factors, as well as the expected growth of the business. So all this is incorporated into one rate. Now, a buyer may pay too much for the business if unaware of the inherent risks of a company carried or when overvalued by the market. And this is really common these days as stocks are easily pumped. Valuation is very useful in determining the true value of the company in question, and this is the main reason it's used. So let's take a look at why these valuation method methods are exclusively their own. A very important thing to know is that DCF and CE valuation are mutually exclusive. This means that they cannot be averaged and taken at face value to obtain a, quote, more accurate valuation they need to be used on their own. It's either one or the other and never use both at the same time. And as with most income-based valuation methods, CE valuation becomes more imprecise and less reliable if, first of all, a business is new or just starting out, so it's tough to forecast cash flows, when there's an unexpected market event such as COVID or the Russia-Ukraine conflict, or if a business falls short or goes above expectations of future cash flows and growth. Nevertheless, income-based valuation is very useful and straightforward in order to get a better idea of a company's true value. In the next few videos, we'll touch on various income-based, relative, and option-based valuation methods. So I will see you all then.